Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing multiple sclerosis. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis, and allow me to summarise the story that we've seen so far briefly. So, we started with an individual who was going to develop multiple sclerosis, and this individual developed an adaptive immune system that was capable of attacking a protein within the central nervous system myelin. And because we don't know which protein specifically in the central nervous system myelin is attacked in multiple sclerosis, we agreed to just call the protein um, central nervous system myelin protein. In particular, this individual is going to develop autoreactive clone, an autoreactive clone of CD4 positive T cells that is directed against a peptide fragment of the central nervous system myelin protein, and they're going to develop an autoreactive clone of B cells that is directed against an epitope of the central nervous system myelin protein. We then saw how we think these autoreactive adaptive immune system cells are actually activated. And remember, we think this is through the principle of cross-reactivity. So we think the individual gets infected in some other tissue by a pathogen that has an antigen which is capable of activating the autoreactive CD4 positive T cell clone and the autoreactive B cell clone. So this is the point that we've now got to, up to in the story. We have effector CD4 positive T cells directed against this peptide fragment of the CNS myelin protein, and we have activated effector B cells that are producing antibodies, specifically IgG antibodies, directed against an epitope of the central nervous system myelin protein. So I'll just write those uh, little things down here. So we have effector CD4 positive T cells directed against a peptide fragment of the central nervous system myelin protein, and we'll call them effector helper T cells. Now, of course, most of these are going to be present within lymphoid tissue, so within the lymph nodes and also the spleen. However, remember, T cells are not static. They do move around the body. They move from lymphoid tissue into the bloodstream and then they come out of the bloodstream at other lymphoid uh, tissues uh, so that they're continuously moving around the body to keep things in flux and keep moving the T cells around. And that means that at any one time there are effector helper T cells within the blood and it's the ones that are in the blood which can actually go into the brain tissue and therefore the ones that are of interest to us. So you've got effector helper T cells present within the blood directed against a peptide fragment of the central nervous system myelin protein. In addition, also in the blood, you have lots of antibody molecules, specifically IgG antibody molecules, that are directed against an epitope of the central nervous system myelin protein. So both of these things are currently present within the blood. Now, of course, if they just stayed within the blood, then this individual would not get multiple sclerosis. In order for them to actually cause the formation of white matter lesions, they need to leave the bloodstream and go into the extracellular fluid somewhere within the central nervous system. And it is this topic that we're now going to explore in a huge amount of detail because there is something very, very important and interesting to talk about here. So, we are about to answer a question that I posed to you right at the beginning of the video, which is, if we've got an autoimmune attack on the white matter tissue of the central nervous system, why do you only get discrete white matter lesions forming in multiple sclerosis? Why isn't it the case that all the white matter of the central nervous system all gets attacked um, all at once? Why is it the case that only certain little blobs, little spots of white matter within the central nervous system actually get attacked by this? And the reason has to do with the fact that it's actually very difficult for the effector helper T cells and the antibody molecules that are the things that are going to cause the formation of a white matter lesion to get 
from the bloodstream into the brain. And this is actually only going to occur in certain areas of the central nervous system. And in the areas where it occurs, that's where you're going to get white matter lesion formation. So the white matter lesions that form in an individual with multiple sclerosis are where somehow the effector helper T cells and the antibody molecules have actually managed to get from the blood into the brain tissue to cause a white matter lesion formation. And all the portions of white matter that are spared, it's because the effector helper T cells and the antibody molecules have not managed to get from the bloodstream into that white matter tissue. So, firstly, we need to talk about why is it so difficult for the effector helper T cells and the antibody molecules to actually move from the bloodstream into the central nervous system parenchyma. And the reason for that is that there is a barrier between the bloodstream and uh, the brain parenchyma. And this is known as the blood-brain barrier, or the BBB for short. So I'll write this down here. So this stands for the blood, whoops, and I've missed out a word, do a, a Excuse me a moment. Ah, redo. Okay, so blood, and then the second B is not for barrier. The second B is for brain, and then the final B is for barrier. So BBB stands for blood-brain barrier. So this, as the name suggests, is a barrier between what is in the bloodstream and what is in the brain parenchyma. And it is necessary to have a barrier like this because there are lots of things in the bloodstream that could hugely impact the function of the central nervous system if they were allowed to go into the brain parenchyma. And these things therefore must not be allowed to go into the brain parenchyma. So, what is the actual nature of the blood-brain barrier? The blood-brain barrier is actually made up of thicker capillaries. So in all your tissues within your body, um, there are capillaries that deliver, well, it, through which blood is going to flow and through which, at which exchange is going to occur. So things like gas exchange will occur. In the brain, you're going to have capillaries as well. However, in the brain, the capillaries are going to be much tighter. And to explain this in a bit more detail, allow me to just draw a picture of a capillary down here so that we can understand the nature of the blood-brain barrier. So capillaries are absolutely tiny little blood vessels. Uh, they have a lumen that can allow a single red blood cell at a time. So red blood cells in single file to move through. And the wall is extremely thin. So these are microscopic blood vessels, the smallest type of blood vessel. You cannot see these and they're present in all tissues. The wall is extremely thin and is made up of a layer of endothelial cells sat upon a basement membrane. And it's the basement membrane that I'm drawing here first of all. So I'm drawing one longitudinally, so this is the capillary here. So in red, this is now representing the basement membrane of this capillary here. Now the basement membrane is made up of connective tissue and it's a rigid meshwork of connective tissue and all the linings of all blood vessels have an endothelial layer that is sat upon a basement membrane and it's the basement membrane onto which the endothelial cells cling. This is the reason the endothelial cells don't just fall into the lumen of the blood vessel. So now let's put some endothelial cells actually attached onto our basement membrane. So here is one endothelial cell. And remember, endothelial cells are a very flat type of cell. They're a squamous cell, very, very flat. So here they are. And this literally is how thick the wall of a capillary is. It's made up of a single layer of endothelial cells sat upon a basement membrane. And then outside of that, you'll have the parenchyma, the tissue that this capillary is within. So I'll just label up the endothelial cells as ECs. So this is an example of a tiny little blood vessel called a capillary. So you have these in every single tissue within the body. Uh, the arteries break down into smaller arteries, break down into arterioles, and the vessels gradually get smaller and smaller. Then you have capillaries and they drain into tiny little venules, which drain into bigger venules, which then drain into small veins, which then drain into bigger veins. And that's the way the cardiovascular system works. So 
all tissues in the body have capillaries present within them, including the brain. And these tiny little blood vessels are where exchange is going to occur. So there'll be red blood cells flowing through the lumen here, and oxygen will be coming out of the bloodstream into the tissue, and carbon dioxide will be coming from the tissue back into the bloodstream. Glucose will also be coming out of the bloodstream into the tissue. So exchange is going to occur here. Now, in most tissues, capillaries are a little bit leaky. They're not as tight as they are in the brain. Now, the way that capillaries can be leaky is that you can have gaps in between the endothelial cells where molecules from the bloodstream, smallish molecules, I don't mean molecules as big as entire proteins, but smallish molecules, uh, such as amino acids, will be able to leave the bloodstream and go into the tissue fluid. However, in the brain, the concept of the blood-brain barrier is that the capillaries are extremely tight. You do not have these little holes in between endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are very well connected together. And the reason that it has to be this way is that lots of the little molecules, such as amino acids, that could come out if we had little gaps here, would have huge impact on the function of nerve cells nearby. In particular, the neurotransmitter glutamate is an amino acid. If it could just come out of the bloodstream into the brain tissue, that will cause major neuronal dysfunction. So we have to be very, very careful about what is allowed to come out of the bloodstream into the brain parenchyma, much more careful than we have to be in all the other tissues of the body. So in other tissues of the body, capillaries are leaky and smallish molecules are allowed to leak out in the small gaps between endothelial cells. Not so in the brain. In the brain, the endothelial cells of the capillaries are extremely tightly adhered to one another so that if anything wants to move from the bloodstream into the brain parenchyma, it has to go through the endothelial cells and therefore the endothelial cells can look at what is moving into the brain parenchyma and say, this can either go or this cannot go. If it cannot go, it will pump it back into the bloodstream to protect the brain from whatever that molecule is. So this is the concept of the blood-brain barrier, that the capillaries in the brain tissue are extremely tight and they monitor what is allowed to go into the brain tissue extremely tightly. Okay, so there is a barrier effectively between what is in the blood and what is in the brain. Now the blood-brain barrier is not going to allow effector helper T cells and antibodies to just cross into the brain tissue. So... We then have to ask how, if someone is going to develop white matter lesions, does it occur that in some areas within the brain, effector helper T cells and antibodies are successfully actually going to get across the blood brain barrier into um, the brain tissue to actually lead to the formation of a white matter lesion. Well, this is something, a very, very curious point, a very, very interesting point that we don't fully understand at present. But what we can say, and we can say more, and we will say more later on, but for now, what I want to leave it at is just something that has to happen in the story that we can't properly explain. I will offer you an explanation, but I want it to be later on. For now, I just want you to accept this as part of the story, that in some areas of the brain, something goes wrong with the blood-brain barrier. And now the effector helper T cells and the antibodies are able to cross that and go into the brain parenchyma. So the next part of the story is going to be in some areas of the central nervous system, we are going to get blood brain barrier penetration. And just to make this absolutely clear, I want to draw another picture of the central nervous system. So we'll put it in here. So again, the same old picture we've drawn many times before. So here is the left cerebral hemisphere. It's on a bit more of a slant than I think I've ever drawn it before. Then there's the bottom portions of the brain stem, the spinal cord, like so, and then the cerebellum. Okay, so here's the central nervous system. So we have our effector helper T cells and our antibodies within the bloodstream. The next part of the story 
is for some reason, and I will come back to try and justify what this reason is, but for some reason, this individual who's going to develop multiple sclerosis, in certain areas within the central nervous system, he is going to get problems, dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier that's going to allow the effector helper T-cells and the antibodies to cross into the brain parenchyma. And when they do that, that's where white matter lesions are going to form. So let's say on this individual, you're going to get blood-brain barrier penetration in these places that I'm marking out in green here. And we'll put one in the cerebellum. Okay, so those six green blobs are representing where we get some sort of problem with the blood-brain barrier in this individual. And now, what's going to be able to happen is the effector helper T-cells and the antibody molecules are going to be able to enter the white matter in those regions, or the brain parenchyma in those regions, and they're going to be able to actually lead to the creation of white matter lesions. So, I'm sorry, at the moment, this just has to be something that you accept as part of the story. Something goes wrong with the blood-brain barrier at the sites where white matter lesions are going to form. We don't have a brilliant understanding of what that is. That's the reason that you get discrete lesions. We will come back and I will offer you an explanation, a potential explanation, as to how you end up getting blood-brain barrier dysfunction at certain areas. But you don't get it everywhere. It's only in discrete areas, which is why you get the discrete lesions in multiple sclerosis. And of course, we know uh, from long ago in the initial videos that white matter lesion formation occurs in episodes. So it seems that you get these episodes where in certain areas of the brain, the blood brain barrier function is damaged and then you get a bunch of new white matter lesions formed. But we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so we're going to get blood-brain barrier penetration. What I now want to turn my attention to is if the helper T-cells and the antibodies are allowed into the brain parenchyma, how do they actually cause the formation of a white matter lesion? So let's now draw them coming in. So on our picture here, because of blood-brain barrier penetration, they're going to actually get in. So we'll start by drawing one of the effector helper T-cells here. So it's still a classical T cell with a very large nucleus here. So this is one of these effector helper T cells directed, remember, against a peptide fragment of the CNS myelin protein. And we're also going to get coming in lots of antibody molecules. And I'll draw these here. So the classical Y-shaped antibody, those are the two heavy chains. And here are the two light chains. And remember, those antibody molecules are directed against an epitope of the CNS myelin protein. Okay, it's action time now. So, the antibodies are going to start this all off. However, to cause the formation of a big, powerful lesion, the effector helper T cells are going to be really important. Remember, earlier on when we were discussing the activation of the B cell clone, I said that it wasn't actually necessary for the helper T cells that were going to help the B cell clone to be this autoreactive clone. And therefore, there was the question of, well, why did you need the autoreactive clone? Well, here's where the autoreactive clone is going to be really important. Without the autoreactive effect to helper T cells, this white matter lesion isn't going to become anywhere near as big. Um, so initially, the area of white matter where you're going to get the blood-brain barrier penetration is probably a very small area of white matter, and then the lesion is going to grow because of what the effector helper T cells are going to contribute. If it weren't for the effector helper T cells, the lesions might stay so small that they would be subclinical, they wouldn't produce any clinical effect, uh, i.e. they might not produce any neurological symptoms. So, effector helper T cells are very, very important, but we'll see how in a moment. But the antibodies go first. So, we now need to introduce something else into the story, of course. We need to bring back in the central nervous system myelin protein at this point. So, here in yellow, this can represent an axon of a neuron. So this is an axon of a neuron. And of course, it's going to be coated by a myelin sheath, which I'll colour in in blue here. So this is a myelin sheath that is coating this axon here. And of course, further along the axon, you'll have another myelin sheath. So I'll put another one in this position here. 
And of course, we know the nature of this myelin sheaf. It's produced by the oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes have processes coming off their cell body, and those processes wrap round and round uh, the axon of the neurons to create these myelin sheaths. And I'll just label this up as myelin. And this myelin is made up of fancy lipids and fancy proteins, and somewhere within this, of course, will be the central nervous system myelin protein that this antibody is directed against. So what's now going to happen is it's going to be able to bind to the epitope of the central nervous system myelin protein that's within this myelin sheath. And of course, in this single piece of myelin sheath, there will be a huge number of central nervous system myelin proteins. So you're going to bring in lots of antibody molecules and they're going to basically dot all over the myelin sheaths, basically. But I'll just draw it for one. So let's put in the central nervous system myelin proteins. I'll get fancy purple. So let's say this is an example of the central nervous system myelin protein here that we have actually launched an autoreactive adaptive immune response against. So what's now going to happen is we're going to get an antibody molecule binding onto this. So I'll just draw this here. So here is an antibody molecule. Those are the two heavy chains. Here's one light chain and here's another light chain. Okay, so the antibody binding region has bound to the epitope of this central nervous system myelin protein that it recognizes. And again, I'll stress that there are loads of these proteins, loads of the antibodies coming in. So you're going to get the whole myelin sheath coated in these antibodies. What happens next? Well, you're going to get inflammation initiated by sentinel cells that are present within the central nervous system tissue. So, I said earlier on when we were discussing the inflammatory response, and this is one of the reasons that we discussed the inflammatory response then, because I wanted you to be able to compare uh, the inflammatory response as it is normally to the inflammatory response in an autoimmune disease. We said when we were discussing the inflammatory response previously that sentinel cells initiate the inflammatory response. And in most tissues, the sentinel cells are macrophages and dendritic cells. However, the central nervous system is not most tissues. The central nervous system has its own type of sentinel cell, another type of glial cell. We've had oligodendrocytes as an example of another cell, major cell type, that's within the central nervous system apart from just neurons. Uh, and now we've got another major cell type present within the central nervous system apart from just neurons. And this is what we call microglial cells. So I'm introducing you to a new type of cell. The plural is microglia, the singular is microglial cell. And these are the sentinel cells of the central nervous system. They are phagocytes, they're dotted around the central nervous system tissue, and they are standing guard for signs of infection. So let me just put one of these in here. And they have an appearance quite similar to dendritic cells. They have processes coming off like so, so that they can look at a huge number, well, a huge volume of tissue. They can look for signs of pathogens in huge volumes of tissue. Now, remembering the standard story of how inflammation is initiated, what happens is a pathogen is present and the sentinel cell sees signs of pathogens. It sees pathogen-associated molecular patterns and it then initiates the inflammatory response. This is not standard inflammation. Instead, this is going to be the adaptive immune system giving orders to the innate immune system to initiate. So think about this a little bit. This microglial cell is a sentinel cell. It's looking for signs of pathogen. If it finds an antibody molecule bound to a protein, that is a giveaway sign that there is a pathogen present. It then knows that the adaptive immune system is attacking something here, and it thinks that the adaptive immune system is fantastic. It thinks if the adaptive immune system is saying that this is a pathogen, then this is a pathogen. So it judges the presence of this complex, and we have a fancy term for an antibody protein complex. We call it an immune complex. When you see an antibody molecule bound to its target, which is exactly what we've got here, 
sentinel cells interpret that to mean that yes, there is a pathogen present. Maybe they can't actually recognize this is a pathogen, but remember, they're not that good at recognizing pathogens. All they can do is look for really stupid molecules that no human cell would ever use. And some pathogens are far more subtle than that and don't use stupid molecules that human cells don't use. And therefore, the uh, sentinel cells have a really difficult time in recognizing them. So again, think a little bit about sentinel cells. They initiate the inflammatory response. The inflammatory response is a major response that can lead to huge tissue damage. You do not want to initiate it unless you are absolutely sure that a pathogen is present. So when they are looking at pathogen-associated molecular patterns, they need to be seeing absolutely loads of them before they will initiate the inflammatory response. They have to be absolutely sure that something is ghastly wrong before they will actually initiate the inflammatory response. Whereas when they see immune complexes, that's a giveaway sign for them that something is wrong. So it's a massive signal for them to start the inflammatory response. So be aware that it's not just pathogen-associated molecular patterns that can activate sentinel cells. It's also, if you see immune complexes, you can activate the inflammatory response. So this is an example of the adaptive immune response going first and causing the innate immune response to act. So the sentinel cells within the central nervous system are these microglial cells. They've found these immune complexes, which are a giveaway sign that something is wrong within the central nervous system. They don't know that the immune complexes are with a self protein, and they're now going to initiate the inflammatory response. So of course, they're going to do the classical way of activating the inflammatory response. They're going to release interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha are two major pro-inflammatory mediators, and these are going to now act on the capillaries in the uh, close-by region, and they're going to make the blood-brain barrier penetration even worse. So they're going to actually make the capillaries bring in loads of white blood cells now. So you're going to get an exudate forming, you're going to get neutrophils coming in, and you're going to get macrophages coming in. So I'll put this here. So this is going to lead to inflammation occurring and you're going to be bringing in exudate, of course, as we discussed previously, and also neutrophils and macrophages. So you're going to be bringing in those two phagocytic cells, neutrophils and macrophages, the two major white blood cells of the inflammatory response. Now, neutrophils are not terribly important to us. The one that is very important to us are the macrophages, the fact that we're going to bring in macrophages. So I'm just gonna draw a macrophage in now over here. So here is a macrophage that's going to come in. And we haven't finished this story yet. You might think that this is now how we formed a white matter lesion. However, the white matter lesion that we formed is still quite small because the inflammation that the microglial cells produce with um, just finding the immune complexes is still not that big. So you've brought in some exudate, you've brought in some neutrophils and macrophages, but this site that's probably been affected by this is still very, very small. The way that the white matter lesion can become absolutely enormous is with the help of the effector helper T cells. So we're going to see the roles of these in making the white matter lesions much bigger than they would be if it was just the antibodies doing it. So that's the antibody's role. Well, actually, no, they're going to go further. So we've now got microglia, which don't like these immune complexes. We've also got macrophages brought in and we've got neutrophils brought in. Macrophages and microglia are both phagocytes. Neutrophils, of course, are phagocytes as well. However, I'm more interested in the microglia and the macrophages. The reason being that microglia and macrophages are capable of destroying, phagocytosing things that have antibodies bound to them. These are the ones that have the FC gamma R3 receptor. So I'm bringing this receptor back up, which remember is a receptor for the FC gamma portion of these IgG antibodies, this bottom portion of the antibody. So microglia and macrophages are going to have this receptor, whereas neutrophils don't have the receptor as much. So, macrophages and microglia are very much so part of opsonization. 
So when they see the myelin sheath coated in antibody molecules, they are now going to start phagocytosing the myelin sheath. The antibody molecules are a big enough urge for them to now phagocytose this. They think that this is a pathogen um, because the antibody molecules are bound to it and therefore they start phagocytosing it. So they take big lumps out of the myelin sheath and they begin to break down the myelin sheaths. So I'll put this here. So we are now going to get destruction of the myelin sheaths. So I'll just put some crosses through here. All of this is going to be destroyed. The axon can often be spared. They can often eat out the myelin sheath without actually damaging the axon that much. However, of course, the loss of the myelin sheath from the axon leads to huge dysfunction of the communication of action potentials along that axon, which is what's going to lead to the neurological symptoms from the white matter lesion. So, we're now going to get demyelination, which means the loss of the myelin sheath from the axons. And this is because we've had myelin phagocytosis by the macrophages and the microglial cells. So myelin phagocytosis. So remember, microglial cells, they are effectively the equivalent of macrophages, resident macrophages, but within the central nervous system. And microglial cells are another example of an antigen-presenting cell, just like macrophages and dendritic cells are antigen-presenting cells. Okay, so let's just summarise where we've got to at the moment, and then uh, we will see how the effector helper T cells are going to be involved here. So, we saw that um, at the start of the video we had effector helper T cells and antibodies circulating within the bloodstream. In order for these to actually cause white matter lesions, they have to penetrate through the blood-brain barrier in some areas of the central nervous system. For reasons that I haven't explained to you yet and which aren't completely understood, but there is a nice theory as to uh, how it occurs, which I'll bring up right at the end. Um, in certain areas of the central nervous system, you are going to get problems with the blood-brain barrier and this dysfunction is going to allow effector helper T cells and antibodies to move across the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system tissue. So in this picture, we decided that this individual was going to get these blood-brain barrier dysfunctions in these six little areas here. Now be aware that these little areas of brain tissue where the blood-brain barrier dysfunction is occurring will be tiny little areas of tissue initially and therefore you would end up with tiny little lesions if it isn't for what's about to happen with the effect to help the T-cells. Uh, so stay tuned for that. So, what then happens is in these tiny little areas, antibodies and effector helper T cells are going to come into the brain tissue. The antibodies are going to cause the problem first. They're going to bind to the central nervous system myelin proteins in the myelin sheath, forming immune complexes. Immune complexes are a driver for sentinel cells to initiate the inflammatory response. So, the microglial cells are the sentinel cells of the central nervous system, and here is one. So, it's now going to initiate the inflammatory response in these tiny tiny little areas, so you start to get white matter lesion formation. So they release pro-inflammatory mediators, the major two examples being interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are going to cause inflammation to occur, so you'll get exudate forming and you'll bring in neutrophils and macrophages. Neutrophils are not believed to be fantastically important in multiple sclerosis because of the fact that they're not so good at opsonization. Uh, so in order to phagocytose the myelin, you have to actually be guided by the immune complexes because that's the only reason you'd want to phagocytose the myelin because it's covered in antibodies. Neutrophils aren't so driven by opsonization in the way that macrophages and microglial cells are. So it's the macrophages and the microglia that are more of the problem uh, in multiple sclerosis. So the macrophages and the microglia are going to start phagocytosing the myelin sheaths and therefore you're going to start getting demyelination of the axons in this tiny little region. However, remember at the moment that this is a tiny little region that we're talking about at the moment. So this might not produce any clinical symptoms at all. Now, let's see how the effector helper T cells are going to make the inflammation 10 times bigger. So, 
When the macrophages and the microglia phagocytose the myelin sheath, what do you think they're going to do? Clue, they're both antigen-presenting cells. They're, yes, you've guessed it, they're going to chop up the proteins of the stuff that they have phagocytosed, and they're going to present the peptide fragments on their surface bound to MHC class 2, okay? So they're going to end up chopping up the myelin protein here, the central nervous system myelin protein that the whole thing is attacking, and putting peptide fragments on their surface bound to MHC class 2. Um, so how should I continue the flow diagram on here? So we'll do it, we'll do the picture for a macrophage because macrophages are easier to draw than microglia. So what's now going to happen is I'll remind you they're both antigen presenting cells. So we're now going to get the macrophages and the microglia in the region. And here is a picture of a macrophage chopping up the central nervous system myelin protein and of course other proteins in the myelin, but that won't cause any problem because we don't have effector helper T cells directed against uh, those other proteins and they're going to put them on MHC class 2, which is what this molecule here is representing. And of course, they put them on MHC class 2 because they got them from the extracellular fluid. They didn't get them from inside of a cell. Okay, so uh, here then is going to be a peptide fragment of the central nervous system myelin protein. So this protein's going to end up being chopped up and when you do this enough times, some of these antigen-presenting cells will end up chopping it up in the correct way that they get the peptide fragment that the effector helper T cells are directed against on their surface bound to MHC class 2. And now what can happen is the helper T cells can say, let's make inflammation much, much bigger. So you have to understand here, I have stressed throughout the video that helper T cells are called helper T cells because they're involved in helping B cells to fight. However, helper T cells do more than just help B cells to fight. They also help inflammation. They help macrophages and other antigen-presenting cells like microglial cells and dendritic cells at the site of inflammation to create more inflammation. They give them the permission to hugely increase the scale of the inflammatory response. And again, this is a checkpoint. It's basically making sure that this inflammation is there for a good reason. And if the antigen-presenting cells at the site of inflammation have on their surface peptide fragments that effector helper T cells are directed against, then that lets the effector helper T cells know that these antigen-presenting cells are actually attacking something worthwhile because they're attacking the antigen that they're directed against. So they activate them to hugely increase the scale of inflammation. So let me put this here. So here is our effector helper T cell here. So here's its nucleus. It's going to come into contact with an antigen presenting cell that's presenting the peptide fragment that it's directed against. And it will say, whippy, this silly inflammatory response you've initiated, it's actually, you know, correct. You should be doing this. You are fighting something that is worthwhile. I absolutely despise this peptide fragment. This peptide fragment is from a horrendous pathogen. I'm absolutely sure of it. Of course, it's wrong. It's actually from a self-protein, but it's sure it's from a horrendous pathogen. And it says to the antigen-presenting cells, make this much, much bigger. Bring in loads more macrophages and loads more neutrophils. Hugely boost up inflammation. So it gives the macrophages within the region and also the microglial cells within the region, the power to release loads of pro-inflammatory mediators, loads of interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, so huge amounts of these. And again, this is an example of where the adaptive immune system is helping to cause the innate immune system to fight. It's basically ordering, these helper T cells are ordering the inflammatory immune system, the innate immune system, to come in and fight much, much harder, basically. So this is another example of the adaptive immune system giving orders to the innate immune system. So of course, this is going to lead to inflammation increasing even more. 
And again, let me give you a little bit more motivation as to why there is this system. Again, remember that inflammation is something that's very, very dangerous to initiate, and you have to be absolutely sure that you're initiating it in response to something decent. When an antigen-presenting cell like a macrophage or a microglial cell has presented to this very, very powerful cell of the adaptive immune system a peptide fragment that it is directed against, then it is very, very confident that this inflammation is there for a good reason. So it can release huge amounts of pro-inflammatory mediators with confidence that this is actually necessary because there is this powerful cell of the adaptive immune system that is saying that this inflammatory response is necessary. So this is why inflammation gets much, much bigger and why the effect to helper T cells are so important in the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis. This is why you do need to have effect to helper T cells that are directed against a peptide fragment of the CNS myelin protein to get this disease. Because if you don't, if you just had the antibodies, the lesions would be absolutely tiny and potentially wouldn't produce any clinical symptoms. The effect to helper T cells results in the lesions becoming much, much bigger because of the massive production of pro-inflammatory mediators and therefore result in um, a large enough lesion to produce significant neurological dysfunction and therefore clinical symptoms. Okay, so that then is the story of how white matter lesions are going to form. Of course, when you produce this, whoops, when you produce this very large amount of interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha, this is going to cause inflammation to occur in a huge part uh, of white matter. So it will now actually get into the scale that I've shown here, where we've got these massive great blobs representing the white matter lesions. And in those regions, you're going to get neutrophils and macrophages coming in, and of course you'll get antibodies and helper T cells also coming in. And the antibodies will bind to the central nervous system myelin proteins, and you will get phagocytosis occurring of the myelin sheath by the macrophages and the microglia in that region. So you will get these demyelinating white matter lesions. Again, I will stress that the actual axons are usually spared. Also, the cell bodies of the oligodendrocytes are usually spared. It's the myelin sheath that is destroyed. So you get demyelination of the axons, but not usually actual destruction of the axons. And this does cause problems because now the axons aren't going to be able to conduct action potentials in the correct way. And that's why these white matter lesions lead to uh, neurological symptoms. Okay, so that is the formation of white matter lesions within the central nervous system. We have a few more questions that I want to answer. I want to talk about how is this autoimmune adaptive immune response actually going to be maintained long term, i.e. potentially for the rest of your life. I also want to talk about the difference between a clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And finally, I want to talk to you about how potentially blood brain barrier penetration actually occurs, an explanation as to what it is that causes in certain areas of the brain a little bit of blood-brain barrier penetration to occur, which then kick-starts an episode of white matter lesion formation. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about how we're going to maintain the adaptive immune response long term, because if you don't maintain it long term, of course, you're not going to be able to ever get any more white matter lesions forming. So in order to have multiple episodes of white matter lesion formation, as indeed is the definition of multiple sclerosis, you have to be maintaining this adaptive immune response. So, remember, we made all of those memory cells, we made memory CD4 positive T cells, and we made memory B cells that were auto-reactive. The effector cells do not live long. The effector helper T cells and the effector B cells will live for a few weeks to months, and then that will be over. If you are going to maintain this autoimmune disease, you're going to have to continually be reactivating this immune response to get more effector cells being produced by activating the memory cells. How is this going to occur? Well, now it actually is going to occur 
by presenting the central nervous system myelin protein rather than by that pathogen infecting you. So when you've got white matter lesions in the central nervous system, in these white matter lesions, we have discussed that antigen-presenting cells, macrophages and microglial cells will be chopping up the central nervous system myelin protein and putting its peptide fragments on their surface bound to MHC class 2 molecules. Indeed, here is an actual picture of that. We've discussed how important that is for actually activating, well, being activated by the effector helper T cells that have come into the region of brain tissue. However, some of these antigen-presenting cells will actually drain in lymphatic vessels that drain the brain tissue, and there are lymphatic vessels that drain the brain tissue. We didn't used to think there were, but we do now think that there are lymphatic vessels that drain the brain tissue. And these lymphatic vessels drain to lymph nodes that are in the neck, the cervical lymph nodes. And then, if we have these antigen-presenting cells coming to the cervical lymph nodes with this peptide fragment from the central nervous system myelin protein that we have memory CD4 positive T cells directed against, they can activate those memory CD4 positive T cells and they will do exactly what the naive CD4 positive T cells did. They'll divide and divide and divide, clonally expand and their progeny will differentiate into memory CD4 positive T cells and affect the CD4 positive T cells. So by continual reactivation of the um, CD4 positive T cell clone, using the memory CD4 positive T cells that you're continuously creating on each activation, you can continuously produce more effector CD4 positive T cells. And that's the way that you're going to maintain your population of effector helper T cells that are directed against this peptide fragment of the CNS myelin protein. In addition, how are you going to maintain B cell activation? Well, of course, it's going to be through the memory B cells. So in the white matter lesions, again, of course, we've discussed that these phagocytes, the microglial cells and the macrophages are phagocytosing the myelin sheath. Again, they'll be doing what they did when we saw activation. They will be releasing some of these proteins into the extracellular fluid so that they can drain into the lymphatic vessels and indeed, our central nervous system myelin protein, therefore, will be draining in these lymphatic vessels down to the cervical lymph nodes, and then it can activate our memory B cells directed against an epitope of that central nervous system myelin protein. Those memory B cells will divide and divide and divide, clonally expand, and the progeny will differentiate into effector B cells and, of course, more memory B cells. And that way, you can continually maintain your population of effector B cells and therefore continually produce more antibodies directed against the CNS myelin protein. So you can see now how important the production of those memory CD4 positive T cells and the memory B cells was. That's how we're going to actually maintain the levels of effector helper T cells and antibodies against the CNS myelin protein long term. And that's the reason, sorry, that's the reason that this autoimmune disease goes on for the rest of your life. Okay, so that is the maintenance of the adaptive immune response. Now I want to talk about the difference between the different types of um, thing that can happen now. So some people will get, of course, what we call a clinically isolated syndrome. Some people will get what we call MS. And of course, we talked about how there were three different forms of MS, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And remember, 85% of the people who initially develop multiple sclerosis develop relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, whilst only 15% of people develop primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And unfortunately, two-thirds of the people who start with relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis will later on develop secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So let's just emphasize the difference between what is happening in these different scenarios here. So we think that the pathogenesis is the same in these different forms of um, disease that can happen. What we think is different is, in the case of the difference between the clinically isolated syndrome and the MS, it's how many episodes of lesion formation you actually get. 
And in between the different forms of MS, it has to do with how well the lesions are recovering after the inflammation dies down. So, in a clinically isolated syndrome, you're only going to get one episode of white matter lesion formation in your entire life, and then you're going to be lucky enough not to get any uh, episodes of white matter lesion formation after that. So when the autoimmune adaptive immune response is initiated, you then get an episode where there are lesions to the blood-brain barrier formed in certain areas of the central nervous system, and you form some white matter lesions within the central nervous system. However, after that, you never have another episode where there are penetrations to the blood-brain barrier being formed, and therefore uh, you never actually get any more white matter lesions forming. So remember, even if you've got the autoimmune response continuing on and on in your blood, if you don't have another episode where there are penetrations being formed in the blood-brain barrier, you're not going to get new white matter lesions being formed, and therefore you're not going to uh, be given the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Instead, you'll be given the diagnosis of a clinically isolated syndrome. Coming on to multiple sclerosis, of course, in multiple sclerosis, the definition is that you have recurrent episodes of white matter lesion formation. So you develop the activated autoimmune disease, so you have the effect of helper T cells within your blood and the antibodies within your blood. You then have a first episode of blood-brain barrier penetration in certain areas, so you get white matter lesions forming, and then months might go by, and then you get another episode where you get blood-brain barrier penetration in certain areas of the central nervous system, and you therefore get new white matter lesions forming. Then again, months might go past, and you then have another episode where blood-brain barrier penetration is occurring, and new white matter lesions are forming. So the thing that I really want to stress to you is that the episodes of new white matter lesion formation occur because something goes wrong with the blood-brain barrier. That's the thing that triggers the episodes of new white matter lesion formation. The adaptive immune response is always ready and waiting for a chance. Whilst it's in the blood, it can't do any damage to get new white matter lesion formation. And the reason the lesions form in episodes is that every time you get an episode of new lesion formation, something has happened that has led to blood-brain barrier dysfunction in a few little areas within the central nervous system, and that's created the opportunity for white matter lesions to form. Now, the white matter lesions will eventually calm down. Eventually, the phagocytes, the microglia and the macrophages, will clear all of the myelin from the affected area. And once all of the myelin has gone, you've got complete demyelination, of course, the antibodies are no longer going to be able to bind to anything then, and therefore, you uh, will stop activating more inflammation. So you won't be having any more immune complexes forming. So this part of the inflammatory response will die down. And also, if there's no more myelin, then these antigen-presenting cells aren't going to be able to present any more peptide fragments to the effector helper T cells. So this activation of inflammation will die down. So inflammation will stop and the tissue will be given an opportunity to heal. Now, the difference between the different forms of multiple sclerosis then is how well the tissue actually heals and regains its function. In relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, the white matter lesions are actually going to heal quite well and the tissue will regain its function. And indeed, you can see remyelination occurring in white matter lesions. Remember, the axons are usually spared in these white matter lesions and the oligodendrocyte cell bodies are usually spared. It's the myelin sheaves that are destroyed. So the oligodendrocytes can reproduce myelin and remyelinate the axons. So that's what we think is happening when you are healing these white matter lesions in relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. In the forms of progressive multiple sclerosis, the lesions do not heal correctly. Remyelination does not occur correctly. It may be the case that the axons have actually been damaged or the oligodendrocytes have committed apoptosis because of the extent of the damage that's occurred. But for whatever reason, the white matter lesions do not heal correctly 
in between the episodes of white matter lesion inflammation, and therefore you end up with progressive worsening of symptoms. And in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, then right from the start of the disease, the white matter lesions are not healing correctly. Whereas in secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, you start off with relapsing remitting cause where your white matter lesions do heal initially, but then uh, your ability to heal these white matter lesions gradually gets worse, and therefore you start to get progressive worsening of symptoms. So I hope that makes clear what these different scenarios, these different types of disease that you can get with this same pathogenesis actually are and how they're occurring. So the final thing for me to talk about uh, in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis is this great big mystery, this incredibly crucial part of the pathogenesis, the blood-brain barrier penetration. And do not underestimate how important this is. If you have the autoreactive effector helper T cells and the antibodies circulating in your blood, and you never have an episode where there is going to be blood-brain barrier penetration, then you will never actually get any symptoms. So you can have the autoimmune disease, but if it can't get inside the central nervous system tissue, it's never going to lead to the formation of white matter lesions. So these episodes where for some reason portions of the central nervous system's blood-brain barrier stops working and you get these little spots where now white matter lesions can form. These episodes are absolutely crucial to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis and we think that the first episode probably does happen concurrently with the activation of the autoreactive adaptive immune response, i.e. when you are being infected by the initial pathogen. Now, let me try and give you a potential explanation as to what is causing the blood-brain barrier penetration episodes. And I want to state that this is very controversial and this may be the absolute crux of why um, some people get multiple sclerosis and others don't. It is thought that potentially a lot more people than we realise have autoreactive effector helper T cells and autoreactive antibodies against CNS myelin protein present within their blood and don't have any symptoms, don't have multiple sclerosis because they don't get ever episodes where they get lesions in their blood-brain barrier um, and therefore blood-brain barrier penetration. Uh, so this is thought to be potentially extremely significant. So let me give you one theory of where these episodes of blood-brain barrier penetration actually come from. So one of the theories, a major theory, but still controversial and only considered a theory, is that it might be to do with systemic mediators of inflammation or mediators of inflammation present within the bloodstream. So let me try and justify this a little bit. So people who do suffer from multiple sclerosis, let's take people who suffer from relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, many of them find that they get relapses when they are ill in a way. So many people with relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis find that they're going to get episodes of new white matter lesion formation, i.e. episodes where blood-brain barrier penetration has occurred when they get an, a severe illness. So when potentially they get flu in the winter, if they get a really bad flu, they find that it causes a relapse in their multiple sclerosis. Or if they get really bad gastroenteritis, uh, which is a uh, gastrointestinal infection, they find that that then triggers a relapse in their multiple sclerosis, i.e. new white matter lesion formation. And this is a common finding that the relapses in multiple sclerosis often occur concurrently with a severe infection. So, why might that be? Well, when you get a severe infection in a certain portion of tissue, even if it's very, very far away from the central nervous system, you're going to get inflammation occurring in that tissue. So let's say, for example, you've got flu. Flu is an infection of the respiratory tract. So you get infection in potentially the nasal cavity, infection in the epithelium lining the nasopharynx, infection of the epithelium lining the larynx, infection of the epithelium lining the trachea, and maybe even going into the initial big bronchi and infecting that epithelium. 
And it can go down even further. It shouldn't do in most young, healthy people. But if you're elderly and your immune system's not so good, it can end up going down into the smaller bronchi and it can even go down into the actual alveoli and cause pneumonia in some cases. Uh, but usually it infects the epithelium of um, the big pipes of the respiratory tract. Therefore, what you're going to get is inflammation occurring in the respiratory tract all over the place. So in the uh, nasal cavity, in the nasopharynx, in the larynx, and in the trachea, and in the bronchi, you're going to get inflammation occurring there. And that means that in those tissues, you're going to get massive inflammatory mediator release. Now, those inflammatory mediators, they don't all stay in the local tissue. Some of them will go into the bloodstream. In particular, our two favorite mediators, interleukin-1, the two most powerful mediators, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, massive mediators of inflammation. A lot of these will end up going into the bloodstream, and they will circulate within the bloodstream. And this is not, you know, this is a normal thing to happen. The mediators of inflammation from a tissue end up going into the bloodstream. And what do they cause? Well, they cause the systemic symptoms of illness. They make you feel tired. They make you feel really ill. They make you lose your appetite. They make your body temperature go up. Uh, they make your muscles hurt and they give you a headache. All of those horrible symptoms of flu. Remember back to the last time that you got flu. You will probably remember you had a really high body temperature. You were going from being really hot to being really cold. You might even have had night sweats where you wake up drenched in sweat. You will have felt really tired. You will have felt really ill. You won't have wanted to eat anything and consequently you will have lost weight. You also might recognize the fact that you had aches in your muscles, your limbs and your back. They ate really badly and you might also have noticed that you get a horrible headache. Those symptoms are what we call the systemic symptoms of illness and they are caused by the inflammatory mediators produced locally in, in the case of flu, the respiratory tract, going into the blood. They are not caused by the actual flu virus going into the blood and going to the tissue. So you do not have muscle aches because the actual flu virus has gone to your muscles. No, you have muscle aches because the inflammatory mediators, the massive amount of inflammatory mediators that have been tipped into the blood from the respiratory tract have gone to the muscles and caused the muscles to hurt. So, Inflammatory mediators go into the blood and cause systemic symptoms, and I'm not going to go over how they cause all of these systemic symptoms um, because it's not important for us. The concept here is that these mediators, interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha, they're the major mediators of inflammation. They cause endothelial cells to start the inflammatory response, to start letting things like antibodies and T-cells, effector T-cells, come into a portion of tissue. So it is plausible that when you have very high circulating interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha within your bloodstream, that these could cause blood-brain barrier dysfunction in little patches around the central nervous system. So plausible, and I'll put a question mark here, that this could be the problems with the blood-brain barrier. So blood-brain barrier, and I'll put dysfunction. I'm going to have to move the board along to actually fit this word in. So blood-brain barrier dysfunction, and I'll put another question mark there. So that would allow an explanation as to why people with multiple sclerosis often find that they get new episodes of white matter lesion formation when they are really, really ill anyway. So when they've got a horrible episode of flu or when they've got a horrible episode of gastroenteritis or when they've got a horrible urinary tract infection or some horrible infection that's making them very, very ill, uh, causing massive levels of inflammatory mediators within the bloodstream, maybe these cause the blood-brain barrier to become too permeable because after all that is what these do. They make capillaries permeable to proteins in the bloodstream like antibodies and also white blood cells like effector helper T cells. So maybe these in some areas in the central nervous system have enough effect to actually allow antibodies and effector helper T cells to enter the central nervous system tissue potentially.
Okay, uh, but it could be a different explanation. However, that is a very nice explanation that affect, that uh, explains this finding that people often find that they get white matter lesion formation when uh, they're very, very ill. Okay, so we'll have a break here. That concludes our discussion of the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. At the beginning of the next video, we'll summarise the entire thing, and then we'll move on and discuss uh, the drug treatment, the current drug treatment of multiple sclerosis, and we'll try to give potential answers as to how some of these drugs work.